today. Amen. Would you look at your neighbor and say, you're looking about as good as you can. Will you do that? <laughs> hey, we all, a, a man's got to know his limitations, okay? We, 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 sometimes, you, sometimes you just do the best you can, and that's all you got. So that's all we can bring to the table. Amen. Welcome to the first week of what I am calling Heaven's Big Idea. I am excited about what we're going to be getting into this year. This is going to be a study through the book of Acts. And I'm excited about walking with you through this journey because I know that God's got great plans for what you and I are going to encounter together because I have been thinking about these things and, and, and planning some of these things for a long time. And anytime God does that, uh, in me, he's he's got a big plan in mind. So Amen. the first few installments of this series is going to be focused around what the book of Acts is mainly about. Now, I'm not going to do an in-depth Bible study. We do those on Wednesdays. Uh, we're reaching more of a diverse group on Sunday mornings. Some of you have been on this journey longer than I have, and some of you just started last week. And because of that, we try to hit uh, every level of maturity on Sunday mornings. We go much deeper on Wednesday nights with our Bible studies, but instead, uh, and that's one of the challenges of doing a, a study through uh, the book of Acts is not going so deep that you miss the majority of the people. So uh, this won't be like a typical Bible study. I'm not going to be limiting my messages to following the verses one by one, but instead we're going to be looking at them as topics. We're going to be studying the book of Acts as the themes go. And as the themes change, we will change with them and we will go with them. So when this series is over, you will understand the book of Acts. You will, you will understand what the book of Acts is about. And, and in most of your Bibles, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. It wasn't a trick question. And I'm disappointed that most of you don't read your Bibles, but that's another sermon for another time. 
It's typically called the Acts of the Apostles. But it really could have been called the Acts of the Holy Ghost. It really could have been called the Holy Ghost building a church. Because that's really what the book is about. And the writer of the book of Acts is universally accepted as Luke, Dr. Luke. The same Luke that wrote one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Acts is considered part two of his Gospel. As a matter of fact, uh, most people don't even consider it a break from his Gospel. Uh, when you study hermeneutics, you'll, you'll find out that most people consider that the book of Acts was a continuation of his Gospel. That it could have actually been one book. But we're going to look at it and understand that it's written from the viewpoint of Luke. So you can often refer back to Luke's Gospels or his Gospel and, and see uh, continuing thoughts that flow from his Gospel into the book of Acts. We begin with Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. And you'll find out that this is Luke exposing himself as the writer. He says, the former account I made. The former account I made. That's his gospel. That's Luke saying, I wrote a first book. Part one was the gospel of Luke. He said, I, I made a former account, O Theophilus. Now, Theophilus is someone that's not in this room, so we'll just skip over that. Uh, of all that Jesus be began to both do and teach. I want you to pay attention to that word, Began. Because notice it says he began to do things. And he began to teach things. And the book of Acts is about the church finishing what he began. Amen. So, so he began. He said in my gospel, in the first book I wrote, I told you about Jesus beginning to do and beginning to teach. Now, I'm going to tell you how the church needs to finish what Jesus started. Amen. If Jesus did it, the church should do it. If Jesus taught it, the church should teach it. And there should be some evidence of what, uh, of what happened because of what Jesus began. Now, if you have your Bibles, I challenge you to turn over to Acts chapter 29. Keep looking. <laughs> Acts chapter 29. 29 comes after 28. Uh, some of you look at me like a calf in a new gate. You don't have chapter 29 in your Bible? You've only got 28 chapters of the book of Acts? That's because we're writing chapter 29. Amen. That's because you and I, and if you read the book of Acts, you'll find out that chapter 28 ends rather abruptly. It doesn't even seem like it should end. It's as if it's telling the story of the Apostle Paul. It says he's sitting in a house. He sat there for two years and he taught people. And that's the end. But it doesn't say it's the end. Many of Paul's epistles, many of the gospel writers would give an amen that they would put a, a punctuation point that let you understand that the book was coming to an end. But the book of Acts just seems to drop off of a theological cliff as if there was nothing there was still something to be said but they just made me stop writing. I'm telling you uh, that, that I think it's to send a message to us that we have unfinished business. Amen. That you and I are still writing the book of Acts today. As a matter of fact, there's chapters of the book of Acts sitting in this room. Families coming back together. That's a chapter in the book of Acts. The blessing of unity when God's people get together and praise God together. A great revival when it sweeps across the land. That's a chapter of the book of Acts. Every time somebody comes forward and gives their heart to Jesus Christ in an altar like this, that's writing the book of Acts. If your marriage used to be broke and Jesus has fixed it, you're writing the book of Acts over at your house. And for that, I think we ought to give God some praise in this church. I remember many years ago when I began to uh, study the Bible and, and I was first taking classes uh, for seminary training. I read a story about Billy Graham and he was about to plan a huge crusade. And he was coming to a very liberal town uh, where there was going to be multiplied thousands of people coming to hear Billy Graham speak. 
And a liberal pastor in that area who uh, fancied himself as very progressive, he came to the city council in protest of Billy Graham coming. And his protest was, we don't want him here because he is too old-fashioned. He will set evangelism back in this town 50 years. When Billy Graham heard of the protest, he said, I apologize for misrepresenting my intentions. I do not want to set it back 50 years. I want to set it back 2,000 years. I have come to this pulpit this morning to decree and declare that we need to get back to some old things. I, listen to me, listen to me. I appreciate how far we have come. Nobody appreciates uh, modern amenities like somebody who grew up with outdoor plumbing. <laughs> I praise God when I find that toilets are on the inside everywhere I go now. Because when I was a little boy, it wasn't so. So I, I appreciate modern amenities. But I'm going to tell you that the early church looked drastically different than the church does today. And there are some things that the church used to have that we could use today coming back to the church. When you read about the early church, you'll notice the absence of some things that you and I take for granted, but we think are very important. Things like air conditioning. Things like projectors that are on the wall. Things like these padded seats that you enjoy sitting in. Those things were absent in the early church. But you'll be thrilled to know about the presence of certain things that I believe we could use more of in the modern church. Things like the power of God in the house. Things of records of people's lives just like you being marvelously transformed into dynamic witnesses for who God is in their life. I'm talking about churches growing by leaps and bounds. How a normal church is supposed to operate. People coming in one way but leaving differently. That's how normal church is supposed to happen. As a matter of fact, when you read the book of Acts, you will find out that the church did more to the society than society did to the church. Acts 17 and 6 says, when, when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city. Jason was running our church out of his house. They showed up and arrested him and all of his church members. And they brought them to the city council and said, these are the ones who have turned the world upside down. And I believe that's what the normal church is called to do. Turn the world upside down. Not let the world turn us topsy-turvy, but instead we influence them and turn them upside down. It was Vance Havner that is quoted as saying, Today's modern church has become so subnormal that one, once one becomes normal, everybody thinks it's abnormal. In other words, we live so far, most churches are so far below where God wants us to be. Once a church gets up to where God would like them to be, everybody in the area looks at them and says, they're irrational. They're crazy. What is wrong with them? Even churches will look in the community and say, what's going on over at that church? They're seeing new people come. They're seeing uh, families wanting to join their church because they've been sitting there for 25 years as dry as last year's bird's nest. And they wonder why nobody wants to come to their church. And they wonder why nobody... And when you start having an influx of new people, it even makes other church people feel uncomfortable. But I want to see what it would look like if a church got back to being more like the early New Testament church. I want to know before I leave this planet what it looks like when people come into the house of God and fall under the power of a God that is so awesome and so inspiring and has met so many of their needs that they have no plans other than to stay in his presence and to dwell there and to let him move them, shake them, flip them upside down, 
turn them inside out. I want to know what it's like to see a church that when broke people come in, they leave repaired. That when people come in with heartache, that God mends up their broken heart. I want to know what it looks like when a church is so full of the power of the Holy Ghost that when sinners walk in, they tremble beneath the power of the convicting awesomeness of the Holy Ghost. And they say, I need what you have. Can you teach me about this man named Jesus? I want to know. Does anybody at Promise of Victory want to know what that church looks like? That's why I want to study the book of Acts. I want to know what that church looked like so I can make this church look like that too. Amen. We have to get back to the basics. Listen to me. If Jesus would have been on Shark Tank, <laughs> pitching his idea to entrepreneurs about how he was going to start I got this new plan for a startup. It's called the church. My CEO is going to be a man who spent his whole life fishing. My board's going to be made up of other professional fishermen. Some guys who will kill you if you don't believe like they believe. I got a thief that I'm going to put in charge of the treasury. And a guy who used to work for H&R Block. This is my team. I want to start a movement that's going to stretch all the way around the world. It's going to meet needs of crippled people. It's going to meet needs of emotionally distraught people. It's going to meet needs of people who can't save themselves. And we're going to teach them how to find eternal life. And the shark tank and talk to entrepreneurs and look at them and say, no, that bunch you won't. They look at him and say, this is not going to work. Not one of those intelligent uh, entrepreneurs would have the audacity to invest in such a harebrained idea. And yet 2,000 years later, the church is still standing. Through all of the attacks, through all of the walkaways, through all the abandonments, through all of the people who said there's no way it can work, it has worked and it continues to work. And I'm going to tell you that the gospel message is it's going to keep on working long after you and I are no longer breathing air on this planet. The church will keep on if that's the plan of Jesus Christ. For all intents and purposes, the church never stood a chance of survival. But Jesus had a plan for it. He got some of his closest friends together one time and he, he said, who do men say that I am? They're standing on the coast of Caesarea Philippi, as the gospel writer records. And he says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? One of the disciples says, well, some of them think you're Jeremiah and one of them thinks you're Isaiah who have come back from the dead. He says, but who do you say that I am? Big mouth Peter. Open mouth and insert foot Peter speaks up and for one of the rare occasions has something intelligent to say. And he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He says, you have spoken well, Peter, Simon, Simon Barjota, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who art in heaven. And upon this rock, the testimony of who I am, I will build a church. And he says, and the gates of hell will never prevail against what I am going to build. Whatever you loose on earth, I will loosen in heaven. And whatever is loosed in heaven or bound in heaven, I will bind it on earth. I want you to know that because God had a plan, the church is still alive and well. Despite the rumors of our early death, the church is still alive and well. Now, there are trends and tendencies that are uh, scary to people like me who loves the church. The trends are that even the most uh, tactful believer in this generation thinks less and less about church attendance. I'm of the generation that grew up where if you were saved, you came to church every time the doors was open. When you got saved, nobody had to teach you to come to church. 
We had church Sunday mornings. We had church Sunday nights. We had church uh, on Bible study on Wednesday nights. We'd have prayer meetings. We'd have revivals. It seemed like early on we lived in the church. It seemed like we was at church all the time. And, and this generation has, has gotten into a mindset that church attendance is no longer an asset to their life. But I want to teach you through this book of Acts that you need to get plugged into the church. Because Jesus did not say he would make you a, 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 a plumber. Or that he would make you a school teacher. Or even that he would make you a husband or a wife. But he did say he would make you a church. That the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There's a promise to the church that you need to be attached to. So the gates of hell have no power in your life Somebody give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Now, no doubt there's people sitting here that already know this. But there's all kinds of folks got ideas about the church. Some people's ideas are good. Some ain't so good. Some ideas of the church are ugly. But that's because we know the church that has been under human management for several thousand years. And anytime humans manage anything, you have problems. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You manage your house and you've got problems. You manage yourself and you've got problems. You, you eat good all day. Let some stress come. You'll be out there eating fried chicken at 2 a.m. with a donut to wash it down with. You've been eating. I've been on a diet. I've been feeling good. All of a sudden, stress got you up. Can't sleep. You have broke the... No, 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 no. Don't tell me that. Don't tell me that you've got everything under control when you go to the shopping center and they say, if you sign up for this credit card, you can get an extra 20% off. Cha-ching! Hand me one over. Give me an application. It's an easy process. You got more credit cards. You ain't going to help me right there, are you? Anytime you're under human management, you have difficulties. Anytime that people are managing anything, there are problems attached to it. And the fact is, the church shouldn't be around, humanly speaking. But somehow, someway, the church has survived. The, the church, you need to understand, is bigger than me and it's bigger than you. The church is a transliteration of the Greek word ekklesia. And ekklesia simply means called out. That means that you and I have been called out from the world. We are no longer members of society. We're members of the church. Oh, I'm, I didn't get very many amens right there. I know that's shocking to your system because nobody preaches this stuff anymore. But we are to come out from among them and be separate. Separate means we're not with them anymore. Now the Bible says you're of the world. You're in the world, but not of the world. Yes, you still work in the world. Yes, you still shop in the world. Yes, you still pay bills in the world, but you're not of them anymore because you have been separated. You have been called out. There's something you got that they don't have. And by the way, there's some stuff they got that you ought to be leaving alone too. But that's a sermon for another time because you have been called out. Let's talk about the church. Somebody say the church. The church is simply the body of Christ. I need you to write that down get that in your memory because we're going to be talking about that throughout this Bible study of the book of Acts. We are the body of Christ. We are a spiritual family. Those of you that just came through the Christmas season, you saw your natural family. Some of you wishes you didn't have to, but that's another sermon for another time. Some of you, when you get around your natural family, you look around the room and say, there is no way on God's green earth. <laughs> Somebody had a mix-up at the hospital. The DNA that is in them is not, never mind. <laughs> but we are a spiritual family of redeemed people who have experienced reconciliation with God and with one another. I wish I could get an amen right there. Because the devil is doing good at driving wedges between folks. But we need to be uh, of the understanding that the church is made up of people who have been forgiven and know how to forgive. Let things go. Not be easily offended. Not be so tore up from the floor up every time somebody upsets us. 
There's two passages of scripture that I want to draw to your attention about the church. Jesus says in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39, he says, these are the two great commandments. You've got to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He said, this is the first and this is the greatest commandment. Amen. And the second one is equally important. He said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Some people I know must hate themselves because they don't treat me. Come on now. If the measure of how they feel about themselves is how they treat me. Y'all ain't going to help me. Y'all getting quiet because it's the 9 o'clock service. Listen, if the measurement of how they love themselves is how they love me, they got some self-love they need to find in this company. Uh -uh, see, see, he says in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, he says, go and make disciples of all the nations. This is what the job of the church is. You didn't know it when you got saved, but you got employed. To go and make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I'm with you always. Even to the end of the age. Amen. Let me explain something to you. And I don't have time to get into this because I'm already running slack on time. We need to stop as the church commanding the world to obey the commands of God. Because they're not with us. We get so obtuse with the world and expect the world to believe what we believe. And we put them down. And, and we're not winning souls. We're driving people away because we're trying to make them believe what we believe. But the Bible says they have blinders on. They cannot see. And he says, by the way, you were like that too. That when you had blinders, you couldn't see the truth. Even if it was presented in front of you, you were unable to see it because you were physically and spiritually blinded. But he said, but now that the blinders are off, you see clearly and you think that everybody's supposed to see clearly. But did you see what Jesus just said? He said, teach these new disciples. To obey the commands of God. You can't expect the world to obey the commands of God. All the way to the White House. All the way across the street from your house. Where you go to work. You've got to stop condemning sinners because they don't act like saints. But what you can do is look funny at the saints when they keep acting like sinners. He said teach these new disciples to obey the commands. But the world, the world has no interest in following the commands of the Bible. It's only after somebody has committed their life to Jesus Christ that you are able to teach them, he said, the commands and follow the commands of God. That wasn't part of the message today. That's just free good advice for you. Listen to what he says. He says to the disciples, you are going to carry out God's plan for me. I'm not going to use angels. I, I'm not going to send back somebody from the dead. Hmm? I'm not going to write it in the sky. He said, I'm going to use you. The church. The ones who said yes. The fishermen. The nature art employee. The tax collector, the, 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 ones, the ones that uh, will kill you as soon as look at you. I want to use you people because you've been converted. He said, I'm not going to use a sign at a football game that says John 3.16. That's not how I'm going to get people saved. He said, I'm going to use living witnesses. What is a witness? A witness has personal first-hand knowledge of something. <laughs> see, 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 we may not all, we, not, we, we may not all in this room be what God wants us to be, right. but we can all tell you, I ain't what I used to be. Thank <laughs> hey, Jesus, I ain't what I used to be. 
I got some bruises. I got some shortcomings. I haven't reached the epitome. I'm still striving. I'm still trying. God's still working on me. But I thank God I can look back and say, at least I'm not back there where I used to be. There's been a change in my life. And thank his name for it. Amen. You think it's tough dealing with Bishop Mitchell. Thank your heavenly father you didn't have to deal with Albert Mitchell. And I'll just leave it at that. There are five purposes of the church that I want to get out before in the beginning of this message series. Because this is going to be the theme we use throughout this series. Number one, the purpose of the church is for us to gather together. Uh, uh, hello? Listen, listen. I appreciate the live stream. I'm glad we have it to offer because there are people that can't be in the building. But if you can, there's nothing like being here. And, and I'm not saying that arrogantly. Here's what I'm teaching you. It's being in the building where Jesus teaches you to love your neighbor. That's right. You can't sit at home and learn how to love people who are difficult to get along with. Right. You can't sit at home and isolate yourself and fulfill the commandment. He said, there's two great commandments. The law is hung on both of them. Love God. We all get that. You can love God because God's always lovely. But the second one is the tough one. He says, you're going to have to love some folk that pluck your last nerve. You're going to have to learn to love some people that, you, that aren't lovely to you. That say offensive things to you. That hurt your feelings. And he says, come on into the house and gather together. Because it's staying in the house where you learn the exercise of getting along with people. Even when they're hard to get along with. So, so we gather together. The second thing is we glorify God together. <laughs> The church gathers to celebrate a very honored guest. Amen. The God of the cosmos. God himself. We learn to love him with all of our hearts when we're within the community of the church. Number three, and this one is very important, church. We grow together. We grow together. I, I learn scripture while I'm preaching it to you. Do you understand that? I'm not just screaming at you. I'm reminded of, of the joke of the little boy. He left, Sunday, he left church one morning and on the ride home uh, with his mama, he says, Mama, I decided this morning I want to be a preacher. His mama welled up with pride and stuck her chest out. She says, Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And she looked back at her little bat bouncing baby boy and says, What in the world made you decide today? She thought he was going to have some big revelation about what the preacher said or about what he learned in Sunday school. And he says, well, I just figured that it's got to be more fun standing up yelling at people than it is sitting there listening to it. <laughs> so, so I'm not just standing up here yelling at you. I'm being ministered to while I'm preaching this word to you. That's the power of the word of God. When it comes forth, it has a, 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 an ability to latch hold of you and touch you in ways you didn't even intend for it to touch you. It will do things to you you didn't want it to do to you. And even the speaker of it is being ministered to it by its being out there. We grow together. You don't grow independently. You grow while you're attached to each other. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. I need you. Can you do that? I need you. And fourthly, uh, we grow together so we can serve together. Amen. We serve God by serving other people. God cares about how you care about other folks. And you, Bible says if you have done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. So, so we serve God by serving other people. We grow out of being babies that consume from God. And we become mature Christians that contribute for God. We invest our lives together. Our time, our talent, our treasure. And we all benefit from each other. This is called ministry. And by the way, in an Acts church, in an early church setting, every member is a minister. I want you to know there is a lady who emails me regularly. She's probably about to hear what I'm about to say. She's in Charlotte, North Carolina. And she watches, not that live stream, 
But this one, with her two deaf children, and she is able to sit there with them and have church from Charlotte, North Carolina, where we have, the Church of God has two huge churches. One runs over 3,500. You've got Elevation there with Stephen Ferdy. You've got some huge churches in Charlotte. And she's having church with us in Colliers, West Virginia. To Floyd Shue being a minister and serving somebody. Listen, that lady may or may not ever darken the doorway of this building, but she's being ministered to because somebody is an able minister who sits here every Sunday and does outreach to these people. Because we serve together. That's what God intended. When he set the church in order, he said, I don't want you to be all about what you get. I don't want you to be a consumer. I want you to be a contributor. And, and the final key to this, number five, is so that Christ's ministry can continue. Uh -huh. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 says, God was in Christ. And here's what he did. He reconciled the world to himself. In other words, he no longer counted people's sins against them. And that he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So you and I are Christ's ambassadors. As though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. Do you know what that said? That says Jesus is passionately committed to rescuing people, to build his church. And he speaks through you to get the job done. He said if you have been reconciled to Christ, he is pleading with the world to come and be reconciled. And he's using you as his mouthpiece. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 17, or, or 27, it says, Christ loved the church. He gave his life up for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. If you are a believer, you need to be committed to what Jesus is passionately committed to. Amen. Which is reaching the lost. Amen. And telling them they need a savior. Amen, Amen. Amen to God. Amen. Is the church a good thing? Yeah. Oh I believe with everything that's in me that it is. But there's other people that have different opinions. The church has done some things very well through the years. And we've done some things very poorly. Ultimately the church is a reflection of the people who sit in the pews. Yes. <laughs> Let me explain something to you because you're looking at me like a calf at a new gate. Church is a big house that is made up of a bunch of little houses. And what, just like when you bake a cake, whatever ingredients you put in the cake, is ultimately how the cake's going to taste. Uh -huh. Come on. Go ahead. If you baking a cake and using spoiled milk, spoiled eggs, and too little sugar, yeah. don't bring that to the pastor. <laughs> if you leave some stuff out, it won't be right. If you put too much stuff in, yes. it won't be right. Ultimately, whatever goes in, Makes the whole thing better or worse. This is a big house. Made up of a bunch of little smaller houses. Whatever's in the small house ultimately shows up in the big house. Whatever the little house has to deal with, the big house eventually has to deal with. If the little house is clean, the big house is clean. But if the little house if the little house has got the gutters hanging off 
and the gutter and the shingles need replaced. Y'all gonna help me. And the driveway needs patching and the roof is leaking. If the little house has got cobwebs everywhere and you're not sure if it's haunted or not, y'all gonna help me right there. Then the big house is gonna have issues. But when you are surrendered to the power of the Holy Spirit, you will do beautiful things. But when you're governed by pride and selfishness and the flesh, Man, we can really make a mess of things. We are never quite where we ought to be. We are always, Christians are always people who are under construction. We, just like Ralph said, going toward Bridgeport, we are constantly under construction. And, and, and we are never quite finished. We all have work to do on us. But when the church works, the church works. I'm telling you, when we do it right, Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 42, says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came on every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among everyone as anyone had need. Verse 46, as continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Notice what happened. Verse 47, praising God. And having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Amen. Listen. When we do it right, people want to bring hurting people to the church. When the church works right, there's no place like it. When the church is functioning right, there ain't no place on earth where you'll find what you'll find. Because the Spirit of God, who has more power than every doctor, rolled up into one. That has more power than every legislative government, rolled up into one. That has more ability than every strong person on the face of the planet and rich people. He has the ability to do things that no humanity can ever uh, hope to accomplish. When we are doing it right, we unleash the power of heaven in the building and people who are all here that are sick and hurting and wounded can leave here saying I was in the presence of God today and Jesus is my Savior and I have been made whole by the Word and the Holy Ghost when the church does it right then it is right honey but the problem is when it's not right if Jesus is good for the world and he is and we are now his hands and feet which we are then the church should be good for the world. Amen. Matthew 9 and 35. Jesus went all about the cities and villages. Teaching in their synagogues. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And healing every sickness and every disease. Among the people. Notice in this passage. Jesus carried out three tasks. Or three important roles. He was teaching. He was preaching. And he was healing. Can you say that with me? Say teaching. teaching. Preaching. preaching. Healing. Say it again. Teaching, preaching, healing. That's the three important roles that Christ did. And remember, the former treatise I wrote to you, O Theophilus, of all the things that Jesus both began to do and teach. What Jesus started, the book of Acts says the church is supposed to continue and finish it. So if Jesus was teaching and preaching and healing, what do you think the church ought to be doing? Teaching and preaching and healing. Healing what, pastor? Anything that ails you. We ought to have the answer to everything. If you're, if you're sick in your lungs, we ought to have a lung doctor. If you're sick in your mind, we ought to have a mind doctor. If you're sick in your marriage, bring your broke marriage, and we ought to be able to fix that too. If your heart is broke, we ought to have somebody here who can surgically put that thing back together and make you feel like it was never broke in the first place. We ought to be doing what Jesus did so we can see what Jesus saw. Because you got to understand, Jesus' ministry was both deeply spiritual 
and highly practical. He helped people. He told them about how to get to heaven, but he also helped them with their life right now. He shared life-changing good news with people while also multiplying fish so they didn't go home. Hello. We are good for the world when we love them like the Father loves them. We heal and teach like Jesus healed and taught. And we depend on the power of the Holy Spirit to get it all done. Amen. How are we ultimately going to do this? I'm glad you asked. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. It says, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, that's you, if you're saved this morning, you're a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now. Somebody say now. now. That's now. That's not later. That's in another season. Now, all things are given of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word, listen, of reconciliation. Ah. And verse 20, tell, what does that mean? That means we have been made right with God. And he has given us the ability. You say, I'm not a pastor. You don't have to be a pastor. I'm not a minister. You don't have to be a minister. You don't have to have the, the theological degree that I have. He says, I, if you are reconciled, he has given you the word of reconciliation. Amen. You can tell somebody how they can be saved. Amen. And verse 20 tells you that you are now on heaven's payroll. Amen. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God was pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors on Christ's behalf, and we have the message of hope because God is drawing people back to himself through the ambassadors. He's using the church to get people saved. And if people aren't being saved, delivered, healed, and taught, we might as well take the name off the front of the building, throw some sawdust on the floor, and turn this place into a moose lodge. Because we have missed our purpose. If people's lives aren't being affected and changed for God, that's the purpose of the church. In other words, we will be good for the world. Are you ready for this? I'm about to drop a bomb on you before I let you go. When you live like you're supposed to, the world will change. Amen. That's right. We keep screaming at the world to change. But what Jesus said was, when the church gets it right, yes. the world will finally see Amen. and change their wicked ways. Amen. It's not on their shoulders, it's on ours. Can, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I share something with you? I don't have time to teach you the intricacies of this, but I wanted to include it in this message. I remember when I first came into the church 20 some years ago and everybody was fighting and arguing. I'm from the Bible Belt where things don't change very easy in the church. And I remember when I came into the church and people were arguing over which translation of the Bible was the right one. Which one was the best one. I'm talking about they were having all-out wars. They were getting on radio programs and talking about other pastors and calling their names and their churches out on the radios because they were using the New King James Version or somebody over here was using the NIV Version. Fighting and screaming with each other, putting down entire groups of people for not using the King James Bible. And I thought in my young Christian mind, you're arguing over something. That you don't even act like you live by. Because you don't find scream at them who don't believe it like you in the Bible. The meaning of translation is the conversion of something from one form or medium into another. So when you got translated into God's family, he changed you. He, he, he made you from what you used to be into something else. And do you want to know what the best translation of the Bible is? Are you ready for this? Yep. The best translation of the Bible is you. 
living a Christ-centered life. Being unmovable, unshakable, being steadfast. You not being easily offended. You being loving and being kind and being tenderhearted. When you stop being cruel and critical and rude and angry, quit putting hateful messages all over your Facebook page toward other people. That is the best translation that the Bible will ever see because that's the one they are reading. I knew some of y'all would like that one. But here's what the Bible teaches us. If you don't believe me, 2 Corinthians 3 and 2 says, you are an epistle written on our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. People are reading your life. You want to know what best translation to use? Amen. Quit, quit having arguments over uh, who left uh, this kind of scripture that doesn't have, oh, that one don't have the blood in it. This one don't, listen to me. I have read the Greek and the Hebrew, spent so much time in it, and, and the Latin, I've done it all. I've had the, the upper echelon of classes from some of the leading authorities in our day. I know all of the intricacies of all of them, and I got news for you. The 1611 King James Version, Got some errors. Because Moses didn't carry that down off the mountain. I hate to break the hearts of some of the people. But Moses didn't come down off the mountain with a red back hymnal and a King James Bible. They're all translations. All of them have been put into the hands of men. And sometimes translations have a difficult time making it. But I know this. When I follow what it says and I live it like it says, I feel the heavens open up and I know that God is walking with me and I know the truth of the word is within the word. And if you really want to know the best translation, it is you getting up every morning and selling out to God saying, I'm going to be kind today. I'm going to be loving today. I'm going to love my neighbor like I love myself. That's a translation that the world will want to follow. Sister Lisa, you won't make me quit because I'm running out of time up here. So you and I, whether you like it or you don't like it, whether you want to or you don't want to, you're on heaven's payroll. And people are watching you. So to the sickness of the world today, be an agent of healing. The world is full of division. Can I encourage you Christians to not get involved in the division, but instead be an agent of reconciliation? Can I encourage us as a church and as a body of Christ to not add to the division? Whether it's about race or Democrats and Republicans, can we not add to the division and instead be an agent of reconciliation? Amen. In a world full of lies, be an ambassador for the truth. Amen. In a world full of condemnation, be an ambassador for grace. And show people that God loves them no matter what kind of sin they have on them. Because by the way, Paul reminded us some of them are liars and some of them are thieves and some of them are sexually immoral and some of them are homosexuals. And some of you used to be the same thing, but God loved you through it and showed so them the love of God through it as well. Amen. Sometimes it feels like hell is winning. But Jesus made a promise Come on. that hell won't win. <laughs> Listen to me. He says, and upon this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of hell, all the power of hell won't be able to conquer. Amen. What Jesus is telling us is not what we think. He's telling us what what he think, what we have assumed for years is that means that when hell attacks us, it won't be successful. But that's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was talking about the church attacking hell. <laughs> that's why he said the gates of hell. Why would he bring gates to my house? Why would he bring gates to my church? No, what God, what Jesus was trying to get us to understand is we can invade 
and take back what the devil has took from us. We can invade our lost loved ones. And although the devil has them in the icy grip of death, you don't have to let them die and go to hell. You can march into enemy territory and snatch them and say, by the blood of Jesus Christ, I pray salvation for you. And all the power of hell can't keep you out. Because hell can't win because Jesus already won. Amen. Amen. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And hell can't win because the church, bless God, is going to fight. All right. The church is going to fight. Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose in heaven will be loosed on earth. You're going to fight. You're going to fight for it. Anybody in this room got loved ones worth fighting for? Yes. Anybody in this room got a marriage worth fighting for? Anybody in this room got a job worth fighting for? Anybody in this room got sanity that's worth fighting for? Anybody in this room uh, got, got, got an attack of the enemy that's been on your family and for generations and you are ready to see that thing broken over your life and you are ready and willing to fight for that? I'm, talking, I'm not talking about that you're just going to stand back and defend yourself. I'm talking about you get up every day and you march around your house and in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm not going to sit here and watch my baby be an alcoholic. I ain't going to sit here and watch my husband fall away. I ain't going to sit here, devil, and let you have my house. I know who I have to be, and I know he's given me the power, and I'm going to fight for it. Fight for it. Fight. Does anybody feel like fighting in this house? Fight for it. Look at your neighbor and say, fight for it. Fight for it. Fight for it. Fight for it. Everybody all over this building, would you mind standing? Fight for it. Fight for it. Hell can't win. Can't win. Hell can't win. If you don't leave here this morning with anything on your lips, leave with that. Hell can't win. Amen. How long you been sick? Doesn't matter. Hell can't win. How long has your kids been lost? Doesn't matter. Hell can't win. Amen. How long has that family been fractured? Don't matter. Hell can't win. Can't win. Can't win. It's not just temporary. Hell can't win. Can't win. All the powers of hell won't conquer a church who's ready to fight for it. Amen. my lost husband. Fight for my lost wife. Fight for my mom and my daddy. Come on, Fight for my financial amen, freedom. Amen, amen. Fight for the ability to sleep soundly at night. Fight. Fight. All the power in hell can't keep you out because if you bind it, it's bound. Right. If you right. loose it, it's loose. Right. God has given the church. That's right. Amen. Listen. He did not give that to individual believers. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church, church. and the gates of hell will prevail against me. You don't have the ability by yourself, but you do. When we all get together, when we're all part of the church, then hell can't stop us. Come on. I didn't intend to do this this morning. But it's been a long time since we did this. I'd like to just get everybody in this church house that's willing and able to do it to make one circle around this church. Hold hands with your neighbor just all around this church. It's been a long time since we did this.